Our uh, our guest in this segment is the uh, first female mountaineer. Uh, she is a former Secretary of State. She's done TV work, and her name, of course, is Natalie Tennant. Uh, probably the most prominent, currently unelected Democrat in the state of West Virginia, I would say. Natalie, good morning. Thanks for coming in. You're welcome. It's good to be here. I don't know if that moniker is so great, but it, it might be true. I think it is true. Because the other one would be Joe Manchin, and yeah, he's, he's elected. elected right? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we were thinking the other day, because we were sitting around talking, we're going, uh, who would be the most prominent Democrat who, would, who could run for governor? Right. Name name the most prominent Democrats in the state. It's a pretty short list right now, Natalie. You're right at the top of it. I th- I think I mean there are prominent people. We have John Perdue, who was state treasurer. He's kind of out of the game now. Yeah, I mean he's still doing service on the federal level through the um, USDA. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a great mayor in Charleston. But that's the fact. But, you don't know her name. Right, right. right. That, and that's the thing. Someone was right. saying, wasn't well, the mayor of Charleston or Huntington running? We're like, what's the name? Well, I don't know. Well, it's, we believe the mayor of Huntington is running. Those are two different people. So that's a that's a good point that you I, make. Yeah. Steve it's Williams, yeah. Amy Goodwin Schumer. Right. We, we know that Charleston. now. No. We didn't know at the time of the Amy conversation. Schumer. Amy, Amy Schumer. Amy Schumer. Amy Schumer's Schumer. a comedian. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the prunes kicking Amy, in. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> Amy Schuler Goodwood. Right. right, but she yes, you don't know her here. No. I don't know if you know Steve Williams, who's the mayor of Huntington. No, I, I've, I've heard the name, but I don't. Yeah. I've never met him. Yeah, he's, uh, he's a, a good guy who's been um, done a very good job in Huntington. You're in uh, Jefferson County today, addressing the Chamber of Commerce. Yes, Tell me I am. What, how that come about? Heather McIntyre and I have been buds for a long time. I'm trying to think even was it before I was um, Secretary of State, but you know, you work so well with Chambers of Commerce and the business side and I was always over here. You know, you know I uh, travel the state a lot and just became friends and acquaintances and would do anything that she's asked. I've spoken to the um, at the annual dinner before and today she's having the membership luncheon at the Bavarian Inn and mm-hmm. she said well, we want to talk about things West Virginia. Take me home country roads. And she thought that I'd be the perfect person. I think you are. And I think I am, too. <laughs> I think you hey, and you also brought Pitzels. <laughs> yeah, I did. It's usually Pita Piata around Christmas time. But there's a special gala coming up in the West Virginia Italian Heritage Festival in Clarksburg. Mm-hmm. And I said I would make some Pizzelles. And what's special about these Pizzelles, they, yes, they have anise oil in them. But um, they also have... Um, Calabrian black anise seed, which is hard to come by in West Virginia. As a matter of fact, it's very difficult to grow. My mother has died uh, almost 12 years ago. She smuggled that back from San Giovanni and Fiore, which is really, you know, she paid for it there. But, you know, sometimes the customs don't sure. let you through with agriculture items. And I don't want to know where she hit it, back. by the way. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, it, it is so good. I should have brought some that was separate because you just taste it. It is so smooth. It is beautiful. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, a real licorice anise taste. Is it a We've berry? It in the fruit. It's an anise seed. It's a black seed. You'll okay. have to try that. And I'm still not happy. I didn't get enough anise in it. Two tablespoons of anise and those black um, Calabrian anise seed didn't do it. But it's for the festival. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, most of, especially north central West Virginia, came from San Giovanni and Fiore. So they will love this. I mean, the black anise seed, like, for a little ounce, would go for $100. So for a pound, $600, $1,200 for, a, I guess, a kilo as they would say in Italy. Mm -hmm. So that's why you got that special, because I slided you on Pita Piata in Christmas. Christmas. (laughs) It was forgivable, though. You were going through some stuff. Yeah, I was. I have been. You are now a cancer survivor. Yeah. Do you like that? I mean, I guess it's better than the alternative. And and I I had breast cancer. I was diagnosed in December of 2021. And I had a mastectomy, just a single mastectomy in February of 2022. So, you know, been building my way up. I'm still going to have to have um, another surgery for to get the uh, tissue expanders out because immediately when they give you a mastectomy, they can put in expanders to then build you back up Mm -hmm. to where you were or where you want to be now. And how are you feeling? (laughs) I feel good. I feel good. I can tell that I uh, I don't need as many naps during the day. Um, I can tell that I better not 
push myself like this is going to be a big weekend in Clarksburg with the gala for the Italian Heritage Festival announcing the Queen and I know that I cannot do uh, an all-nighter tonight I'll never make it till Friday and Saturday so you've got to you know you you, you know that too and mm -hmm. and, and um, cancer survivors I think I'm hopeful that they know it and that they give themselves this opportunity to take a nap I sleep a lot in cars when I'm driving and traveling while Whoa. you're behind the wheel while you're driving uh, no I wish I mean you sound like my grandfather <laughs> <laughs> I wake up at the red you know, light <laughs> well sometimes I do have fallen asleep at a red light before <laughs> and the, the car does this ding like oh the car moved ahead of you so get up and go yeah. But you know, I just want people. Uh, thank you for for mentioning it because you 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 probably tell people all the time. You got to listen to yourself. You have to advocate for yourself and for women. Make sure you get a mammography. And I I have mammographies before that every year, and it was clear. But I just noticed something didn't feel right. I was having pain, and people say, you know, you have cancer, you don't really feel the pain. But I was feeling pain, and I just went back in and said, I need another mammography. Well, you know, uh, when I, people ask me questions, after 2016, I got all kinds of, as I said, when I got my diagnosis and surgery, mm -hmm. and people ask me questions afterward all the time, like, how, how did you know? Because there's a lot of people that have suspicions something's not right with themselves, mm -hmm. but they don't want to do anything about it for a variety of reasons. And I tell everybody the same thing. Listen to your body. Your body's going to tell you when something's wrong. Now, sometimes it doesn't. And you, right. that's why you got to get your exams and make sure you, you hit your markers at certain ages for the things you're supposed to get because it's a lot easier to head stuff off early. And mine was caught in stage two, so I was pretty early along oh, yeah. in the process. I was, uh, and I owe that to my uh, my wife and a good friend of ours uh, who nagged me to go because I'm one of those people who just didn't wasn't real serious. I wasn't going to go to the doctor. Yeah, yeah. And, and Matt's over here bragging to be in his 40s. <laughs> you know, if you were a woman, you would have to have a um, a mammogram, yeah. perhaps by now, when you're 45, get your colonoscopy, make sure that you do that. And I also say that too, you know, I've, you know, I've got my Italian stuff on my mind for this weekend. Then the following weekend is the Breast Cancer Walk by the West Virginia Breast Health Initiative. And they help people all over the state. They actually, there's an organization here and I can't remember it. It may be through Hagerstown, but helps the Eastern Panhandle. They, they don't do anything, 100% oh, of the money stays in West Virginia, mm -hmm. but Hagerstown serves serves the Eastern Panhandle. Yeah. And go to wvbhi.org and you, you can do it. You don't have to be there to walk, but you can certainly sign up and help um, raise money because they help with insurance. They help with gas cards to get to doctor's appointments. When you talked about any, you know, any particular reason people don't go, sometimes they don't have the gas mm -hmm. to be able to get there. And then, you know, I'm just fortunate enough to been able to, to have the wherewithal to be able to drive back and forth. I've got all my, my surgery and everything at WVU. Um, partly because that's where Hannah Hazard was. She's the, she leads the Breast Cancer um, Institute at WVU. And my dad was alive at the time, and he lived in north central West Virginia, and so I could care for him and still go um, go have my appointments. I didn't know you lost your dad then. That, just that's just a, last month, March that's a tough time. 2nd. Yeah. Wow. He's 94. Like, and you know what's cool? He, he died in the same house where he was born. Like people don't get to do that much anymore. Right. I mean, I think you have to be probably in your 90s to, to have yeah. that happen. But the, what he did in between as a, a teacher, educator, fought in World War II, was lieutenant tenant and led tanks. And, uh, um, you know, so we're, we're thinking of him. Great generation of people. Yeah. Right. Yes. Matt Harvey. Yeah, um, give us a little preview of, of some of the things that you plan on the touch, touch on today at your talk. I'm going to talk about, I, I've called it West Virginia, see what I see. And you all know this, and you too, Matt. I know that you travel the state a lot. I've had the opportunity to see various areas and region. And I think, you know, it's like take me home country roads, show us all the fun stuff that, that West Virginia has. And I will do that. But then also some of the struggles. Um, last fall, I had this opportunity to be a uh, a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School Institute of Politics. I, I got to live up there, you know, resident fellow, and I had open office hours. You know, usually I was in, in connection with the undergrads, but these postgrad or postdocs, post uh, uh, graduate students would come and want to talk to me, and they want to talk about, about one of th three things, or maybe all three coal, 
Climate or Joe Manchin. <laughs> um, In that order. Yeah. Sometimes not. <laughs> sometimes the first wing is Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin. Reverse the order. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so this um, uh, professional woman came in. She was from China. Her father, grandfather, and brother were coal miners. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? I said, oh, you got a West Virginia story here. Mm -hmm. And um, she wanted to do, uh, she wanted to understand and do a study about uh, the transition from coal, the energy transition from coal, and make sure that it's a fair, just transition for coal miners, their communities, their economy. And I was like, oh, well, you know, because you hear that all the time. I told you the three things they want to talk about. And I said, well, you know, you just, if you're going to study it and talk about it, you got to come. You got to come, whether it's Kentucky, West Virginia, or Indonesia, India, or China. And so I say, come to West Virginia. Well, sometimes um, I kind of get my mouth out in front of things. <laughs> she came back to me and said, we're doing this study group and we want to come to West Virginia. So I had to back up. The whole point to this is I hosted 15 graduate students in West Virginia. And I got to see see what I see, what they thought of West Virginia through their eyes. I mean, I know, you know, I'm a defender of the coal miner and I'm a defender of West Virginia. You better not stereotype us into one way or the other. But they came and they listened and they learned. And I'll talk about that a little bit, about what they felt like. Um, they wrote to the dean afterward and one of the students said it was one of the best experience they had at Harvard. And so I know that that's what we can show. If people will come and see what we see, maybe experience it and, and don't have stereotypes and and these students didn't because they had to listen first did they start with the stereotypes I think what they started with not not the stereotype about who we are but about coal and climate and it's like let's just stop mining coal they may have had that stereotype but then when they come and they talk to coal miners and they see that you know it's more than just an industry it's an identity and think about this, and this is what I'll be able to show too, Matt, is that as a former statewide elected official, as former mountaineers, a former television reporter who did stories all over the state, I can show these, these folks at the, um, the Jefferson Chamber of Commerce is that what I see in Jefferson County is different than what I might see in Beckley or McDowell and Mingo County. There's no coal mines in Jefferson County. So there's, it's difficult to have that family understanding or that heritage passed down but that's what i will i will show and and i would love to take some jefferson county people to the same exhibition coal mine in beckley and and get that same experience my response to some of the students would have been we can stop mining coal, but when you plug in your Tesla, you're not going to have any power for it. Just remember that. there's It's interrelated. Well, but, but it is. But then you also have to look. We even had a delegate, um, Todd Kirby, who is a delegate from from Raleigh County, who was really open and and fair, Republican, because you know, we have 11 mm -hmm. <laughs> Democrats in, in the House of Delegates. So he was a Republican. Ten, and he until, listened. until they seat Daniel Walker's replacement. You're at 10. Oh, that's right. Yeah. It's, that's right. Uh, it's been announced. Yeah, Annette uh, uh, Hamilton, Hamilton. Oh. And, but I don't know if she's been sworn, sworn in. in that's, yeah. a, that's the point, yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, you look at the numbers and he's like, oh, 35% of our electricity comes from coal. Well, I remember about eight or nine years ago when I was running for U.S. Senate, it was like 90%. Mm -hmm. So it just goes to show is that there is this. You have natural gas now. Um, you, you drive across the, 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 you know, 68 and you see all of these um, wind turbines. And then solar is becoming more and more um, prevalent all over the state. So it, it is that all of the above. And this is what I love, too. It needs to be. It, yes. It, it does. And see, and, and you're saying this. I'm not sure if you would have said that to me back in 2013 or 14 when oh, I was I would, running I, for U.S. Senate. Oh, I still would have said that to you. P, you I you, always uh, believed it needs to be all forms of well, energy. Well, good. Because we need to be you. energy independent from the rest of the world. That's right. We can't right. have someone in another country a couple oceans away telling, telling us the price of everything you're yes. doing is affected now by how many barrels I'm going to supply. Yes. But when I was running in 2014, 14, I was anti-coal when I said that. 
Sure. That's what people, and it's like, oh, now the vision that we had eight years ago is now what the legislature gets to boast about now with, you know, I, and, and this is when it hit me. I had stopped by the Capitol and all these lawmakers, I saw a few, a, 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 a few of um, that I knew, some of them I can't, I don't even know, I can't recognize now. Um, they were getting on this school bus. I'm like, what's it, what's this tour? Oh, this is a green school bus. This is an electric school bus. And I'm like, oh, well, aren't we so embracing? now of and it's like that was our vision eight or nine years ago and now they are saying we're all of the above well and it and it, and it takes eight or ten years for these things once you have an idea and a vision why? for them to, to, to come through why technology no we had the technology then that's my point it's like if you wouldn't have been you the big you yep. um wouldn't have been calling you know ideas that i had with 3d printing with um with solar and, and all of this anti-coal in, instead of saying in addition to coal i never said anti-coal i said in addition to coal if we'd have done that eight years ago why wouldn't we have been the first to have electric school buses like that's that's my point it's always like you know it takes so much time well, to the, convince somebody to say let's let's be the the early adapter instead of the laggard it, it is as as a a number of states are it is a conservative state that takes to change begrudgingly well i'm not sure it's well it, i mean i guess conservative in a different way i don't mean it politically conservative exactly Exa I, that's I mean, exactly what i was going to say people are conservative in terms of how they're going to approach change. Oh yeah, I mean it's 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 just how it's just how we were raised too. I mean, we just had this this mindset that maybe we're not allowed to expect more. We're mm -hmm. not allowed. And that's what, you know, people ask me, how was your experience at Harvard? Well, one, it was great because I didn't have to be on Zoom everywhere. I got to go into an office and see people. And then you work with students who has much expected of them in a place that has much expected. And that's what I want West Virginia to be, that, that you can expect more, that it's okay. Sometimes we don't think that we're allowed to say, we want the best or we want to do this. And that's, that's what I would like to talk about, Matt, is you know, make us expect more. I mean, do you know what it would feel like if someone expected more from you? Oh, we, Mike Hornby always... expects a lot from me. Every good. day he tells me. He's on next, by the way, too. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, talk you know, he's to a, him You know he's bit. a delegate now? I saw him, and I just talked to him back there a little yeah. bit, too, and he talked about some of the, you know, you, you know, you guys were grilling Tammy, and she didn't have exactly to be able to say this piece of bad legislation, like a campus carry bill, mm -hmm. an anti-vaccine bill. You know, Mike could talk about that if he wanted to. And he has, Because he, yeah. he's, you know, he's... He's immersed in that he's, stuff. And he's level-headed. Mm-hmm. So, hey, let me ask you about. Ahead. I want to go back in time to I think it was 2014 okay. when you were Secretary of State and you decided to run for Senate, right? As well, I don't know if I've asked you this before or not, but I always thought at that time that you were a better fit for the House than the Senate. And Nick Casey, I thought was a better fit for the Senate oh. than the House. So I, I thought if you two had flipped. I thought there was a real good chance you would have won that House seat. I didn't like your chances in the Senate seat oh, as much against Selly, uh, Selly Shelley, but I thought your chances in the House seat, and because the House would be a much more of a, of a Natalie's district election as opposed to statewide, yeah, yeah. I thought your odds of winning that seat would have been greater. Alex obviously won that seat, and he's become entrenched in that seat. Now he's running for Senate. But has anybody ever mentioned that to you before? No, have you ever thought about no. it? no. No, because I, I think you know Nick came in afterward, and I don't even know if Nick was in the, in the, con, not that he had to be in the consideration. If he had considered it mm -hmm. at the time to run for Senate, do you think he could have beat Capito? I mean, and then the way 2014 just ended up, it's like we all got right smeared. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if Nick could have beaten Shelley. I don't know if anybody could have beaten Shelley. But I, I when I saw that set up, I really thought it'd been better flip. But I thought you could have won that house seat at that time. Well, and, Nick Casey could have won that house seat. I don't. I don't know what he 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 should have won. It was so close. We we really thought that he was going to win it. But he didn't. It, no. But I thought you could have. I mean, and you think I could have even? Well, we, even in that year of just well, you, uh, red wave, I, I don't think Nick Casey was as well known our, as you. Yeah, he he doesn't have he didn't have the name recognition that you did at that time. Certainly true, true. But that's then that's my point. Then how would he have beaten Capito? I don't know that he would have beaten Capito, but I thought that you're saying that I had you, I should have gone for that one. I thought you were a better a better match for this for the congressional race. Yeah, actually, I think someone 
it was way early on. Uh, remember, I had um, an 11 year old t turning 12. She turned 12 during that in 2014. And I think six years sounded a lot better than running every two years because that, you, you know, you, mm -hmm. you would really change up her life. Yep. She could have gone somewhere for six years, but, you know, it would have been a back and forth. How much, um, how much did you uh, confer with Joe Manchin during that time in regards to, I'm going to run for the seat, what do you think, kind of stuff? Not as much. He, he helped some. Um, I would have liked him to have... You know, they use emails, you know, it's all about fundraising and, and it's all about, you know, sending emails out and getting, um, you know, just raising money. That, mm -hmm. That's really what it is. So he he was supportive on that end, gave money, used emails. Um, I would have liked to have him to be on the campaign trail with me, like, you know, side by side. Didn't happen. No. I mean, I don't know. I mean, he was helping a lot of people at that time. But you're his hometown girl. Yes. And you're thinking there should have been some more loyalty there. Yes, and, and you know, <laughs> I mean, I think I think you know, not. I mean, you have to define loyalty. You know, I'm his campaign daughter's trail. age, so yeah, yeah. Campaign yeah I mean, trail. you can look at the you can look at the campaign trail. Mm -hmm. So, is uh, running for office still a possibility for you? You're still young. Well, you all have very good insight. What are my chances? In West Virginia right now? <laughs> yeah. Not so well, good. It depends. Unless you switch parties. Yeah, what's the office? That's what it, well, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you know, if I'm a prominent person, the most prominent non-elected Democrat in West Virginia, but I just don't, I don't think governor is, is there. I mean, every seat in the book is open. So I don't, yeah. I don't really know. I mean, and it's, you know, sometimes you give, I, I, I truly don't know mm -hmm. if, if I would run for anything again. Uh, not not again, not ever again, but in the near future. Ma yeah, maybe in the near As future. As a non politician, what I would love to see is a politician, irrespective of party, come out with a vision, you know, an, an image for America or Berkeley County or West Virginia or whatever it's going to be that's based on principle and it's based on an uplifting, positive message that stresses what we can be, not what we've been, not who hurt us in the past, not who the, the, the bad guys were currently in office. Ignore all of that and paint this positive picture of where I want to take you. And if, if any, what any the next politician, the first politician in recent times who comes up with that will win. I think if well, they I did can, that if in 2020. I did that in 2020 <clears throat> because I had lost in 2016 and I had moved that secretary of state office from, you know, stacks of papers on desk with hand input to electronic filing of businesses. I I moved that secretary of state's office more than any other secretary of state has in terms of uh, voter registration in terms of uh, election reforms. And I was ready, you know, in 2016 to move it on to the next step. And then in 2020 showed exactly that, showed what needs to be done as far as businesses. I was ready to take off a, a, a dollar fee that um, the Secretary of State had put on after I left. So I had that positivity. I had positivity when it came to, you know, welcoming in um uh, military spouses who oftentimes, ha well, actually, they have the some of the highest unemployment. So that was a positive thing that I was talking about. And then, you know, when you have to stay vigilant on election reforms, and it's it, reforms make it seem like, oh, you got to go and change everything. No, it's not. It's not really election reform. Then it would be election forward thinking, as you're talking about mm -hmm. election positivity, because you have to be ready for people who are trying to say, oh, th this happened, which is was a lie, you know, or this machine does this, which isn't the truth, or this program does this. So you always have to be ready for that. At the same time, you have to be moving forward. And that was my record. And I ran on my record. But, um, it, you know, I was a Democrat. And my record wasn't considered. People won't open it up. And that's that's the frustrating part um, about running for office. And that's the question that I ask, too. Would people listen and see the positive things that I have done? And here's what I'm doing now. You see, I am willing to bring people into West Virginia. I'm, I consider myself still being a leader and still looking out for West Virginia, even though I'm not elected. 
And even though I don't even know there's a path, because it's not about that. You got to you have to be positive, mm -hmm. and you have to show and welcome people what we have to offer. It's, Come uh, see what I see. Quite the uh, turn you've seen in the state in your day here, Natalie, from mm -hmm. the time when everybody who was a D got elected and you couldn't get a lunch with an R. Now, if you're an R, you get elected, and the Ds are somewhere else. And like I said, that's uh, what we brought up the other day. You're the most prominent non-elected Democrat in the state in terms of name recognition and a person who's held office. And after yeah. you, the list drops off to a bunch of people, like you mentioned, John Perdue. But John's name's been out of the game. I don't think anybody's talked about John in a while. And then yeah. after that, you got to go to mayors of cities that, if they were standing in front That's of us, point, we wouldn't yeah. recognize. Right? Well, Amy looks like me. <laughs> we get confused all the time, so you'll recognize, I'll recognize her. her. If you're in Clarks or uh, Charleston, you'll I'll recognize her. Say Natalie, she'll go know Amy. <laughs> Hey. And that's what I say. People come up. When I'm in Charleston, they say, hey, Mayor, when she's in other parts of the state, they're like, you're the best mountaineer we ever had. And she'll say, yeah. She's taking we're the glory. Often, yeah. Hey, thanks for dropping by. Oh, this is great. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Yep. Natalie Tennant, and the best of, t best of luck to you and continued good health. Thank you. I appreciate that.